to halfway done with your classroom stuff, so that's pretty exciting. What is that from? Okay. So, housekeeping stuff, spring semester stuff. Uh, syllabus is up. It's been up for a while. Hopefully, it's pretty self-explanatory. I haven't gotten any questions. I don't think we're moving any tests. I know technically it says there's class next week on MLK. Obviously, that's an online module. There's no actual class. Lisa wanted me to make sure that I said there's... I don't expect you guys to log in on MLK day. She said that'd be a big Bethel faux pas. So, nope, that's not the point. It's just for the sake of that week is when it starts, right? So, normally, we'd meet. So, I've got uh, next week... This, well, so we did, uh, so far, Derm, um, and then the bone mineral lecture are up. Talk about just general pain medications today. I don't think you guys really have like a clin med general pain module. It's kind of incorporated into other things. So I think it's a good point for us to integrate in and just talk about the pain drugs in a lot of detail. And that's what we're going to do today. And then next week, I'll have a couple shorter modules. One is about osteoarthritis. So it'll be more applications to this module. So as far as how do you treat osteoarthritis, which is the most common pain syndrome you'll encounter in your careers probably, especially if you do family practice. And then talk about rheumatoid arthritis too. So that's the plan. And then the exam will be the following week. So no class next week, exam next the week after. And then we'll meet up again uh, for, I think, GI and endocrine is the next module we'll tackle. All right. Now, with this lecture, we're going to have some talk about pain conversions and opioid conversions, and I will post practice problems. For the exam, I do want you guys to know how to convert people opioids from one to another. So that's something that makes people nervous. Trust me, I'm going to give you three practice problems, and the two ones that show up on the exam will be very similar to two out of the three practice problems. So if you understand how to do them, be in really good shape. And honestly, it's like, it's really simple math. It's just a little bit of getting to know how to do it. I really think it's important because everyone, you know, essentially everyone deals with pain management at some point in their career. And you're going to encounter people on opioid regimens. You may not have to convert somebody directly in your practice, but I guarantee it comes up at some point. So I really think people should just be comfortable with the practice of it, which is why I make you guys do a little bit of math. But again, it's very easy math. So without further ado, we'll talk about medications for pain. I think I've got a quick little case review here for bone mineral. Uh, so we've got an uh, 82-year-old male with osteoporosis started on alendronate six months ago. Anybody know the class of alendronate? What kind of medication that is? No. Bisphosphonate? Yes. Uh, so today he complains of significant reflux. Is that a side effect of a bisphosphonate? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. So he confesses that he often <laughs> takes a medication with food and forgets, or sorry, yes, and forgets to do so before fan. So ideally you take it before breakfast, right, on a completely empty stomach. He also admits sometime laying down for a bit after his breakfast, and that's a big other no-no. So basically he's doing the two things wrong you should never do. Um, reviewing past clinic notes show that TL has a history of medication compliance related issues. Which of the following medication may be the best option, or better option for TL? C. 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 Perfect. Why is that one a good one? It's once a year, it's IV, you don't have to worry about any of the issues. And honestly, when you add everything up, it's not that much more expensive. Yeah. Why are we going to do the IV of the IV? Yeah, I think it's just, I think if you, what's that one, every three months? I, it's, I'm trying to remember, I don't want to get them mixed up. Every three months. So I think if you do the cost analysis on that, it's about, it's going to be more expensive to do those four doses throughout the year. And then, you don't get any efficacy benefits off of it. It's going to be the same. There's no clinical evidence that shows, says it's better or not. So while it's an option for some people, and some insurances might prefer it possibly, so it could be something where they say, no, we want you to use this for whatever reason. But zoledronic acid's been around longer, and it's going to be less expensive for the majority of patients. All right, for the big Lebowski fans in the room, for people who don't know what this movie is, please don't get offended. I'm not promoting gun violence in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> All right. Uh, so pain. Um, pain is pretty straightforward as far as different types of pain syndromes. It's all kind of the same general strategy, and that strategy is don't use opioids unless you have to, and try and use other things except opioids before you use opioids. And that applies to pretty much every type of pain syndrome you're going to encounter. Now, there's some types of pain where you go to an opioid quickly or right away, uh, but that doesn't mean you can ignore everything else or tr not try other things for synergy. So we start with our bottom tier, which are our non-opioids. It can be things like NSAIDs and Tylenol or acetaminophen. Um, and then our opioid, this is kind of the mid-tier that the WHO puts up. 
are kind of what I'd call like mini opioids, like codeine. Um, codeine is technically an opioid, well, it is an opioid, uh, but it gets metabolized to morphine once it's in the body, but it's like at a one to 10 ratio. So when you take a dose of codeine, you're getting a really weak dose of morphine, essentially what it does. By itself, codeine's not a super powerful analgesic, which is why it's on the second tier there. And um, it's why if you've ever worked in an emergency department or urgent care, or any place where people prescribe short-term pain medications for people and are wary of drug-seeking behavior, they'll prescribe Tylenol-3. Have you guys heard of T3 before? Mm -hmm. So that's Tylenol with codeine or acetaminophen and codeine. It's a very weak analgesic, probably slightly more effective than plain Tylenol, but people might argue that it actually is just you're adding a narcotic as a placebo. So sometimes people will do that as opposed to prescribing like a more potent opioid. And then there's tramadol. We'll talk about tramadol. It's kind of a, an in-between unique mechanism. It has a little bit of opioid activity. Um, so it technically is an opioid, but I, I don't really classify it as that, even though it's a controlled substance. And then you've got the full-on opioids at the top of the pain scale. So there's some other tricks we can try here, and I'll try and give you all of my tips and tricks. But ultimately, in some cases, you know, if you're working with certain surgical patient populations, you will likely just be prescribing opioids right off the bat post-surgery because they're going to be in a lot of pain. Uh, it depends on what type of practice you work in and what their mentality is. But a lot of it's it's not like I'm trying to say you never go to opioids right away because you do sometimes. Uh, but there's certainly ways to uh, minimize the use overall and minimize the length of duration of your opioid use. All right, so let's start at the lower end of the scale and talk about NSAIDs. So we've, I mentioned NSAIDs a number of times so far this year, and we'll d dig into them today quite a bit. So uh, 17 million Americans estimated to use an NSAID on a daily basis. It's really common worldwide medication use. In fact, um, the rest of the world, well, at least in Europe, they love NSAIDs a lot more than us, and they don't like opioids as much. So post-surgery, it's really common not to give opioids in some instances where we would give them routinely. So there's some different practices there amongst developing nations. But anyway, NSAIDs are going to be ubiquitous no matter, no matter where you go and practice, if you choose to practice somewhere outside the U.S., but certainly very popular here as well. Um, increase as a large portion our population is shifting from middle age to elderly with baby boomers moving into retirement age and that's going to increase degenerative inflammatory uh, conditions such as osteoarthritis and then rheumatic conditions also tend to increase with age as well even though they are also more associated with younger populations but you're going to see more use uh, just in the general population that number tick up historical use uh, are salicylates like aspirin were actually used exclusively until 1950 and then the first non-salicylate attempts to make a um, uh, uh, analgesic medication were let's just say were not where were toxic and indomethacin was the first safe NSAID to come on the market we still use it occasionally today so NSAIDs kind of came in the in the 1950s is when they first hit the market Okay, nowadays, what do we have? We have about 20 different NSAIDs on the market. There's six different pharmacologic categories. Like, if you look at your textbook, they'll break them all down. It doesn't really matter. They all essentially do the same thing. We don't mix and match NSAIDs regardless of the category they fall into. They're all within the class of an NSAID, so don't get that confused. And I'll, I, I'm not going to talk about that much more than that. Uh, variable kinetics, dosing, and frequency. This is really the big difference between NSAIDs out there. So you have some that are dosed four times a day, some that are dosed once daily, some that are dosed twice daily. That might depend on how convenient your patient uh, wants their medication regimen to be. It's going to lead you towards picking one NSAID over another. Most NSAIDs have very minimal first pass metabolism and minimal SIP interaction, so it's nice they don't really interact with the liver. Um, short acting NSAIDs, I put the, the more common ones in here, so like ibuprofen, diclofenac, ketorolac, indomethacin are all less than six hours, so you think those fall in that QID dosing range or Q6 hours dosing range. Uh, Long-acting NSAIDs would be naproxen, celecoxib, meloxicam. Uh, those ones are usually twice daily or in some cases once a day dose. Toxicity is variable. So we talked about the renal toxicity with NSAIDs. We'll talk about a couple other issues and controversies with NSAIDs today. Um, and patient response can be really different too. Some patients might say, you know, naproxen, even though it lasts long, I only have to take it twice a day. I just don't get the analgesic relief as I do when I take ibuprofen. It's a common complaint. So um, just because one doesn't work doesn't necessarily mean another one won't. So it's worth trying different ones in the class if you aren't getting a response to one of them. Okay, so backing up a little bit, that's a, a little intro for you. Now talking about the precursors in the pharmacology just for a brief moment here. We talked about this last semester at the beginning, but just to review. So arachidonic acid is our eicosanoid precursor. And so that's Icosanoids are inflammatory and immune messengers. So once there's some sort of a tissue injury that's going to caused by some sort of external stimuli, you get arachidonic acid releases that gets converted by cyclooxygenase 
further into the variety of things that we've already talked about, um, some of them extensively so far this year, but or last year, I should say, um, but prostaglandins, prostacyclins, thrombocins, and leukotrienes. So prostaglandins pro uh, being the one we're going to look at causing in inflammatory processes that lead to pain syndromes, and that's what NSAID's mechanism uh, relies upon as its analgesic component. Here's our diagram, just to reiterate that. So to review the cyclooxygenase enzymes, we have COX-1 and COX-2. COX-1 is our constantly active, responsible for housekeeping prostaglandins, so that has stuff to do like gastric epithelial side of protection. There's also some theory that it has some vascular protection as well, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, COX-2 is inducible, upregulated depending on stimuli, and a major source of inflammatory and cancer-related prostaglandins. Again, very simple way to look at it, but basically um, all NSAIDs should um, inhibit COX-2. So that's going to be the common pathway. Um, when we talk about non-selective NSAIDs, they're going to inhibit both. Most NSAIDs are non-selective to a certain degree. There's only one on the market, which is Celecoxib, which we'll talk about in a little bit of detail in a few slides, that is a COX-2 selective NSAID. COX-2 selectivity has its own issues with it, which uh, I'll point out here in, in a little bit as well. So keep that in mind. But all NSAIDs to, to be analgesic have to, re, have to inhibit COX-2. That's a common mechanism. Okay, so we have non-COX-2 selective NSAIDs. So these ones are going to be um, pretty much, a, the way this chart breaks it down is these ones will be more or less a one-to-one -one where they inhibit COX-1 and COX-2 with the same rate. Um, some with, and this should probably say more COX-2 activity. These ones are going to be a slightly more selective for COX-2. We don't really care. I mean, they're still going to have some COX-1 issues with them um, as far as decreasing the availability of those housekeeping prostaglandins. And COX-2 selective. Again, there's only one on the market right now. They put metloxicam and etotalac on here in the site because they're heavily COX-2 favored, but they still have some COX-1. They aren't purely selective. Again, Celecoxib or Celebrex is the only drug on the market that is COX-2 selective. What are all these ones that sound like Celebrex? Uh, they've been removed from the market due to side effects, due to poor clinical trials, or due to other issues with them. So the one that was on the market uh, most readily was, isn't even on here. We'll talk about that one in a second and what happened to it. But again, Celecoxib is the only uh, pure COX-2 left on the market. All right, we've talked about the renal toxicity a lot, so I'm not going to re renew that here. We spent a, a whole module on that last time, practically. Um, Pregnancy-related concerns. So pregnancy and uh, NSAIDs is a little bit controversial. Generally, they aren't used. That's kind of a, a good rule of thumb. However, there are some times when it is appropriate, and there are certain trimesters where it's appropriate. That's all I'm going to say about it now. We'll talk about pain management and pregnancy during the summer, and I'll go through the specific trimesters and stuff. So that's not going to be on the test, but just so you know, it's a general precaution when it comes to uh, I, um, NSAID use. And then GI bleeding risk is the one we haven't really talked about a ton yet, but I've alluded to a few times. So these two graphs here show you uh, the incidence of GI bleeding with different NSAIDs. Now some of this stuff, like I'd have never heard of this drug before, this azopropazone. I'm guessing because it's GI bleeding risk is off the charts, probably never used. Um, but like if you look at ibuprofen, which is Advil or Motrin, the most common one, actually has a really low uh, um, incidence of GI bleeding. It's interesting because it's heavily balanced between COX-2 and COX-1, right? So it's one of our purely non-selective um, inhibitors of the cyclooxygenase enzymes, which you would think would make it less likely or more likely to cause bleeding because it's going to um, inhibit the production of those housekeeping prostaglandins. In this case, it doesn't really show that clinically. So it's interesting that, again, you can look at this kind of stuff and think about, well, is this going to help me break it down side effect wise? Probably not as much as you think, so it's not quite intuitive. So I definitely go off where the evidence is leading us, and I'll talk about some of this stuff in the future. Now, at the end of the day, every NSAID has a risk of GI bleed. You can't get around that. Um, so you kind of lump them all into one pool, but certain ones have higher risk than others. And drugs like ibuprofen um, tend to have lower risk overall. Uh, they don't have celecoxib on here, but a COX-2 purely selective would have the lowest risk out of all. So celecoxib um, would have some risk, theoretically, but um, almost minimal compared. So that was how those COX-2 selective drugs came about, is they wanted an NSAID that provided analgesic relief, but didn't have the GI bleeding related risk. And that was a good theory, but um, had some issues with it, which will come up here in a second. Uh, I put this chart on here, same thing. Here you've got relative risk of GI bleeding. These, these are both GI bleeding related uh, charts here. And you've got uh, ketorolac with a very high incidence. 
And so Ketorolac or Toradol is one of the ones we get really worried about. We only actually give it for short bursts of the time because the longer you give it, the higher likelihood you get a GI bleed with it. It's very toxic from that specific side effect. It's a very theoretically a higher potency NSAID, especially when it comes to side effects. Some people think it's more clinically effective for providing analgesia, but that's debatable for the literature, and we'll talk about that uh, as well in a little bit. All right, so anyway, your prostaglandins disrupt that mucosal, or your prostaglandins protect uh, the mucosal gel layer and therefore protect the, endo, the, the underlying uh, cells in the GI tract, and NSAIDs disrupt that. They don't allow the prostaglandins to keep that layer intact, and therefore acid can get into the cells more readily that way especially if you've had a previous GI bleed or you're prone. And these are some of the general risk factors. So whenever we're talking about GI bleeding risk and NSAIDs, this is um, some of the information that you just want to keep in the back of your mind as something that would be important to screen a patient for. So somebody older, an older patient over 65, creatinine clearance less than 40, um, if they aren't renally eliminating the NSAID, they can accumulate more readily and therefore cause increases in side effects. Um, other drugs, so anti, anything anticoagulant, right, that'd be a big, big red flag. Not that you can't, I think people say you can't use NSAIDs and be in an anticoagulant, and some providers will, will go with that. Other ones are like, you know, your osteoarthritis is unbearable, ibuprofen works great for you, I'm going to take the benefit over the risk here and go with it and kind of roll the dice. I mean, it's not guaranteed that that person's going to get a, a GI bleed, but I just don't think it has to be an absolute contraindication. Now, again, some people may disagree with me on that, but I think if you look at the incidence, yes, there's a higher incidence and you should try other methods, but do you want your patient to be in constant pain when they could avoid it somewhat easily? Or you know, think about as needed use too. If somebody's like, I just really need a dose in the morning and that's it, that's probably relatively safe. Um, prevention. So we can prevent GI bleeding or, or limit GI bleeding as well. So the COX-2 selective celecoxib has lower risks. That's an option for some patients. Also proton pump inhibitors are medications that reduce um, upper GI tract pH, or sorry, increase upper GI tract pH. So they're going to decrease acid production, right? Um, like a proton pump inhibitor would be uh, a drug that has been shown to improve uh, the risk of a GI bleed, decrease the risk of a GI bleed. Some other drug interactions, lithium, we haven't talked about lithium yet. It's a uh, drug used for bipolar disorder we'll talk about during psych, but NSAIDs can interfere with the renal clearance of it, and lithium is really toxic if it gets a little bit outside of its therapeutic range, so it's something that can cause a pretty significant interaction in those patients, something to be aware of if you work in mental health. Um, Antihypertensives, NSAIDs don't work well, uh, or work against natural vasodilation, so your body's natural vasodilators, your endo or your prostaglandin production gets shut down if you take chronic NSAIDs. So somebody who's not taking ibuprofen or naproxen around the clock uh, and also has hypertension, it could be a, you know, a compounding effect going on with that. Uh, doubling up on NSAIDs, uh, they're OTC, so it's easy for patients to do if they don't really know otherwise or aren't paying attention um, and not knowing they're the same class. So just keep that in mind if you ever have a patient on a regimen like that. Make sure they aren't taking, then goes for, there's lots of combo products too, like right, Advil, cold, cold and sinus and things like that that could be very easy to double up on. All right, how many guys have heard of cardiovascular risk in NSAIDs? Anybody know? I feel like there's articles pulled around the internet about this here and there. Um, some reputable, some not so much. Uh, but so COX-2 selective CV risk. Uh, the idea here is that there's some cardiovascular complications that can be linked to NSAID use and NSAID use alone, all things considered. And the idea is that they increase thromboembolic complications. So the decreased prostacyclin production can predispose you to vascular endothelial injury. Therefore, you can get a clot formation due to just the natural clotting response the body will have. Um, so Vioxx was the other drug that was on the market that was purely COX-2 selective, and it was actually removed from the market due to a uh, twofold increase of CV events, like myocardial infarction was the mo most common one people saw, and it was removed from the market. It's been off the market for several years. Um, Celebrex somehow avoided that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how, but it didn't show that the, it increased the risk significantly at standard dosing, only at higher doses. So Celebrex has some more strict dosing control, and I think if you use it in low doses, it's generally okay for a normal person. If you have somebody who's post-MI or has heart failure or is at risk for cardiovascular complications, probably best to avoid it altogether. 
Uh, so anything COX, select, COX 2 selective uh, would carry the highest risk or more COX 2 selective would carry a higher risk. But then again, we just talked about all NSAIDs have some COX 2 inhibition. So all NSAIDs have a CV risk technically. Um, naproxen, based on some retrospective analysis, thought to have the lowest risk. So we have naproxen having the lowest risk of causing uh, CV-related events and ibuprofen having the lowest risk of causing um, GI bleeding. So those two, even though they're over-the-counter, they're old, and people might think, oh, they're OTC, they aren't that effective. They're actually really good NSAIDs to keep people on and start people on because they work just as well as a lot of the prescription ones, and they have uh, a bit better side effect profile overall. Uh, what else? Anyway, all other NSAIDs essentially carry some kind of increased thromboembolic complication, theoretically, including naproxen, even though naproxen's data shows that it might have the opposite effect. It still falls into that NSAID category, and I still wouldn't say there's clear-cut evidence to say that it's it's a total, um, you know, it gets a free pass compared to the other ones. So what do people have risk of? I said MI. Um, other things you could get, stroke, uh, in exacerbations of heart failure, atrial fibrillation, CV death, general CV death. Uh, small one to two person per a hundred per a thousand per one to two events sorry per a thousand person years. Um, if somebody has low CV risk and is going to take short term therapy or use it as needed, there's virtually no risk in taking NSAIDs. So I think what happens is I see these articles sent to me by family members or somebody brings it up and it's like NSAIDs have these CV risks, you shouldn't use them, they'll cause heart attacks. And for the average person, the way most people take NSAIDs, probably not for like the occasional headache or back pain or whatever it is, it's people who are taking them chronically, people who are at risk for cardiovascular complications where I'd, I'd maybe say not to use them. But for the majority of the population out there who's going to use NSAIDs, it's generally safe to use them. So definitely not a contraindication, again, unless you have some pre-existing cardiovascular complications. Any questions on that side effect? Uh, aspirin interference. So, if, as we know, um, aspirin works with the arachidonic acid pathway as well. So, there might be some issues there potentially, right? Theoretically, um, the presumed me mechanism of action is that NSAIDs interfere with antiplatelet activity via competitive or comp yeah competitive binding with aspirin uh, for the on the COX-1 enzyme, and then they prevent the irreversible reaction that inhibits COX-1 for the remaining life of the platelet. So NSAIDs might rever reversibly inhibit, whereas aspirin would permanently inhibit that platelet for its remaining life cycle. Therefore, you might get some diminished effects with aspirin. Um, the pharmacodynamic interaction has not been seen with salicoxib or diclofenac. It's most risky with your non-selective NSAIDs. So ibuprofen and naproxen thought to interfere, but again, we just talked about how naproxen might have some, some of its own antiplatelet activity, so it's a little questionable. And all these studies look at these little subsets, so it's NSAID risk is, is a little bit scattered as far as evidence goes, I would say, uh, but we do the best with what we have. So I'm not trying to be purposefully confusing on this. I just think it's worth, because all this stuff comes up and these are such commonly used medications. Anyway, one of the things you can do to, to get around this is space the drugs about two hours apart from aspirin. So if you give your aspirin and let it reach its peak levels, theoretically, it's going to get throughout the body. It's going to work on the platelets it needs to. It's going to bind to those sites. It's going to bind tight. And when you give the ibuprofen, nothing's going to happen as far as platelets go, theoretically. Uh, so that's one way we can uh, look at doing Otherwise, naproxen, even though um, thought to maybe be a non-selective NSAID and they're shown to interfere with this process, Again, has this uh, possible sustained antiplatelet effect that it comes along with. So there's that to consider as well. Um, NSAIDs of all kind are contraindicated for perioperative pain in post uh, bypass surgery. So post cabbage is contraindicated for this reason. So um, that's immediately, I think, going forward, you can take NSAIDs in some of those patients, and that's going to be a conversation you have with the provider about what's the need for the NSAID, how much pain are you in, have you tried other things? Those types of conversations it can be difficult to have because, like for example, just this isn't really related to heart, but it's similar. My dad uh, takes warfarin; he has chronic, or he was on warfarin, now he takes um, Pradaxa, but he's on um, chronic anticoagulation, and he uh, takes ibuprofen. It's the only thing that works for his osteoarthritis. It works really well. He only takes it once or twice a day, and so he runs into this all the time. And I get thrown in the middle. Oh, my doctor told me not to take that. I'm like, are you in tons of pain? He's like, I can't get out of bed unless I take it. I'm like, just take it. It's better for you to get out of bed, get moving than to risk. It, that's just my opinion. You know, there is a risk there, but certainly I think that there's a benefit you have to weigh in as well. So again, I'm not, I'm not a fan of a blanket contraindication for some of this stuff. 
but certainly when it comes to CV risk and multiple heart attacks or a big bypass or something like that, a little bit more severe than a theoretical GI bleed that may never happen, in, in my opinion. So take, take it for what it's worth, but that's just my, uh, my thoughts on that. All right, ceiling effect theory. So this is an interesting concept, and there's a lot of cool smaller studies, but I've yet to see one really big study that's convinced me on this. I have some colleagues that disagree and, and love this. But anyway, so um, you can only get so much analgesia out of an NSAID. So there's a number of theories, uh, studies out there that show that if you give somebody 400 milligrams of ibuprofen and 800 milligrams of ibuprofen and you randomize them and control the trial, you don't get any difference in analgesic response. It's the same thing. So there's thought to be some sort of a ceiling effect. Now, however, some people will say that you get more anti-inflammatory benefits. So if you look at like a rheumatology journal, they might say that they got better response for uh, rheumatoid arthritis using 800 milligrams of ibuprofen versus 400. If you look at somebody who did a trial in an emergency department for acute pain, they might show that hey, this 400 dose worked just as well as the 800. And in fact, this oral dose of ibuprofen worked just as well as this person who gave IV ketorolac to, which is an IV form of NSAID. So there's some of this stuff out there. Now, uh, again, how important is this ultimately? Uh, it depends on, on how, what you think about. I think that some patients will say, you know, this dose just doesn't work for me or I need 600 milligrams or whatever it might be. But certainly start low and then work your way up. There's no harm in doing that. NSAIDs should work very quickly. So the nice thing about um, trying pretty much any of these pain medications we're going to talk about is you should get relief within 20, 30 minutes um, of taking the dose, assuming you don't have like a huge meal sitting in your stomach. Uh, but even then, so like you're looking at an hour to tops to see the effect. And if that doesn't happen, you could redose at that point. So I'm always a fan of starting on the lower end. It doesn't mean you have to like really baby step it up, but you know, start with some, start with 400, 200 milligrams or so, depending on the size of the patient. And then you can always give another dose after that. All right, did I skip some NSAIDs? I feel like I missed a slide here. Well, I haven't really talked about them yet. I feel like this wasn't very well organized on my part. I'm sorry about that. Okay, anyway, let's move on to, oh, I guess I just started it. Started it over. Okay, so uh, salicylates, let's start there, I guess. So th these are kind of an NSAID. Salicylates do have some anti-cox effects, just like ibuprofen or naproxen would. Um, their role in pain management is very limited, if, if non-existent. To take aspirin for anti-inflammatory effects or even some analgesic effects, you need grams of it a day, and most people get a lot of dyspepsia when they take that much aspirin and won't tolerate it that well. It also increases bleeding risk too because it inhibits platelets substantially. Um, salicylate, or sorry, salicylate, I should say, is a weird drug that people forget about. It's kind of like an in-between. I think of it as not as risky as a full NSAID for people who want something for pain management. Tylenol might not be working, so maybe they want to try something that's not quite an NSAID because maybe they've had bleeding risk in the past or they have CV risk. Uh, it could be an option to try. It's cheap, but it's just not very commonly used. I don't think it's all that effective, but could be a possibility for some people out there. All right, acetaminophen. Acetaminophen isn't an NSAID, so I threw it in here because it uh, doesn't really fit anywhere else. It's got its own mechanism. No one really actually knows how Tylenol works, believe it or not. Uh, it's got an undetermined mechanism, probably the most common drug taken in the world. People don't really know how it works. It's thought that it might inhibit like a, a different type of centrally active subtype of cyclooxygenase. Like there's a theoretical COX-3 that's active. Actually, I don't think COX-3 is theoretical. I think it exists, but whether Tylenol interferes with it or not, we don't really know. The point is it works differently than, than a standard NSAID. Um, you might hear it referred to as paracetamol. That's a British or European generic name of uh, Tylenol. And then APAP is a really common abbreviation for acetaminophen. Uh, 325 to 1,000 milligrams every four to six hours as needed. And uh, the kid's dose is 10 to 15 mg per kg. I don't want you to know the kid's dose. We'll talk about that in peds later. What I do want you to know is this max of four gram a day. There will be a test question on that. I want to make sure that's stuck in all your heads uh, after you leave this class. It's really important to be able to counsel somebody on that and to explain to them and to know if they've taken more than the maximum daily amount of Tylenol. Um, Tylenol, per most clinical trials, is an inferior pain management strategy. However, it's worth a shot because it's virtually benign, doesn't have kidney issues, it doesn't cause GI bleeding. The only time it hurts people is if they take a ton of it, it causes hepatotoxicity. And we'll talk about that in detail during tox and how we manage that, but that's basically Tylenol in a nutshell. And you have to usually get like double the daily dose acutely to see some hepatotoxicity. So if you take like an extra 
thousand milligrams in a day accidentally and you're up to five grams, probably minimal risk with that. Usually it's like seven to 12 grams is kind of where you start to see those toxic enzymes elevate. Um, it's a pretty good antipyretic, so it does reduce uh, temperature and fever quite well, and that's why we use it in pediatric patients so much. But as far as a general analgesic medication, again, worth a shot. It's basically first line for any type of pain syndrome, and you're going to get a quick response with it. So just like any other of the drugs we're going to talk about today, take it, Tylenol orally you should have a response within 30 minutes or so. And if not, you can move on to something else. I always recommend for people to to stick to the higher dose. There's no real issue with giving somebody a thousand milligrams of Tylenol. There's no, again, no renal dosing, nothing like that. So um, I'm of the mindset if they're going to try Tylenol, make sure you give them enough that it would actually work. So if you give somebody 325 milligrams of Tylenol, is that going to do it? I don't know. If you give them a thousand, it's probably much more likely to actually have an effect if it's going to. So I'm a proponent for max dose Tylenol. And that's generally the strategy we use for osteoarthritis management. So anyway, go with 1,000 unless, you know, the person's 95 and on the borderline of hepatotoxicity or hepato failure, I should say. Um, maybe not, but for most patients, they can tolerate a, a decent dose of Tylenol once in a while. Um, Tylenol is safe in pregnancy. So contrasting to NSAIDs, it's safe generally throughout all trimesters of pregnancy. Um, acetaminophen does come as an IV product as well, believe it or not. IV Tylenol exists. Um, it's like the bane of pharmacist's existence because it's super expensive. And generally speaking, you could give oral and just be as effective. There's The problem was is the company that made this came out with all these trials that compared um, using IV Tylenol with nothing and use in like post-op patients for opioid and they with in comparison with opioid use. So like, for example, they had one arm where they gave them IV Tylenol and IV morphine. And then one arm where they just gave IV morphine, and they showed that the people who got IV Tylenol used less morphine. Well, they didn't compare that to people taking oral Tylenol. Oral, oral, oral Tylenol costs like a penny a tablet. So if you did that, would you get the same results? Is it just the drug that matters, or is it the fact that they gave it IV and it gets to peak therapeutic concentrations faster? That's still debatable, and I think most people's opinions that it doesn't matter. But we do get some physicians anecdotally that, that rave about this stuff. So... Certainly, if you have a patient who can't tolerate PO and suppositories, or you can give Tylenol rectally. There are suppositories that exist, but that's inconvenient for everyone involved. So IV tends to be easier for those patients. So there you go. Uh, just some other pearls about acetaminophen. It comes uh, in combination with everything under the sun, as you guys probably already know including combination opioid painkillers. So if you ever prescribe any combo products, whether they're over the counter or prescription, make sure the patient's not already taking a regimen of Tylenol because they you can overdose somebody really easily if they don't understand the two are combined, especially when they're used to calling it Tylenol or acetaminophen even, and then they see this prescription bottle and it says APAP -AP on it, and they're like, I don't know what that is. I'm just going to take it because they told me to, and they're five grams a day of Tylenol for a week straight, and they're toxic. Uh, okay, anyway, hepatotoxicity, I talked about this already. Um, there are hundreds of deaths annually. It's one of the most common, it is the most common medication presentation on overdose uh, in the United States. Uh, most of them, fortunately, people recover quite easily, but there's there's tens of thousands a year. So you do see some hepatotoxic toxic patients that end up going to complete liver failure and death. But it is very treatable, which is the other good thing. Again, that's all I'm going to say about it. We'll talk about it later. All right, ibuprofen, uh, brand names Advil or Motrin, most commonly used NSAIDs. Seems like everybody probably takes ibuprofen at some point in their life. Um, similar to acetaminophen, when it comes to OTC use, you're going to see a lot of combo products prevalent in uh, in your drug aisle, cough and cold aisle, that type of stuff. 200 to 800 milligrams Q6 hours, max of 3.2 grams a day. I'm not concerned you know that dose. This is debatable depending on who you talk to, but if you look at the more serious pain syndromes like rheumatoid arthritis, where you dose pretty on the high end, you'll see 3.2 is the max. For general, like, you know, I don't know, less severe pain, 2.4 or so would be maybe more, two grams a day or something like that. But 3.2 is the technical max. Um, five to 10 mg per kg per dose in kids. So the dosing in kids actually, the nice thing about ibuprofen and Tylenol is they correlate, uh, they, they cross over at that 10 mg per kg do per dose. So it's a really easy thing to remember if you're ever thinking about dosing a kid. Um, and if you haven't gotten a call to dose a kid's medication yet, um, welcome to the medical profession because that's what most people will randomly text me about. And like, oh, I haven't heard from you in a while. Oh, your kid's sick? How much? I've got this old dexamethasone prescription. How much can I give them? Um, what? <laughs> anyway, 
So uh, OTC tablets are 200 milligrams. All OTC tablets are 200 milligrams. You can get uh, prescription strength ibuprofen and 400, 600, 800. Do you need to do that, or can you just tell them to take multiple OTCs? You can tell them to take multiple OTCs, no problem there. Just a matter of, is the patient going to like doing that? Some people might find it more convenient to take four small tablets than one gigantic 800 milligram. If you've ever seen them, they're, they're decent size, so a lot, a lot of people might have issues swallowing them. Even healthy, normal people who don't complain about taking pills, they're just really large tablets. But it's maybe easier for some patients just to get the whole dose in at once versus taking a bunch. So anyway, certainly no problem in, in doing multiple over the counter to make up that dose. You don't need to prescribe it per se. Uh, most trials will agree that NSAIDs in general control pain overall better than acetaminophen and ibuprofen and naproxen actually tend to be kind of at the top of the pack for how well they work for pain management. So, um, But oh, across the board, I, I don't think I've ever seen a study that says Tylenol did a better job at pain control than when compared head-to-head -head with the NSAID. NSAIDs always win. They're also good antipyretics. I don't think I said that, but they will reduce fever just like Tylenol. Uh, naproxen. Um, naproxen or... Aleve or Naproxen. Naproxen, Aleve is the most common generic, or a brand name that you probably think of as far as the over-the-counter version. Naproxen was a slightly different, or is a slightly different salt formulation. Its dosing is a little bit different. So not that this really matters a whole lot, but I'll just say this, and I'm not going to test you on this. So you can tune out if you want. But um, Naproxen, uh, Aleve brand is Naproxen sodium. And so you see Aleve dosed is like 220 milligrams a tablet. Whereas the naproxen is dosed in more standard increments, like 250, 500. And it's just the salt formulation ionizes differently, so it's a slightly more potent version. Nothing, nothing to, to write home. They're very similar, but it's, a, it's not quite a one-to-one -one dose to dose. If you ever work somewhere where like, oh, we don't stock the regular leave, but we stock the naproxen style. Same thing. Um, similar to ibuprofen as far as efficacy goes and risks, um, OTC strengths are lower. Our, there are RX strengths that exist that are much higher dose. And again, as available as the base and sodium salts. Whoops. I broke these ones down as the acetic acid NSAIDs. Now, again, I don't care that you know these are acetic acids, but I just put them on the slide because they're all in this category. Um, the ones I think are most commonly used are the two bolded ones, ketorolac and diclofenac. doesn't mean you don't see solendac, etotolac, and indomethacin used. You do here and there. Um, ketorolac is an important one to spend a, a minute on, though. A lot of people think ketorolac is the most potent NSAID out there. Again, some studies out there debate this. So like when I was talking about giving different doses of ibuprofen and not seeing a, seeing a difference, a lot of times what you'll see in some of these smaller studies done in emergency departments is people who give a, a low dose of ketorolac um, IM versus a control patient getting a dose of Tylenol, or uh, sorry, dose of ibuprofen orally, and they have the same efficacy. So um, it's been a long in my career, it's always sort of been the mentality that ketorolac is more potent. And I think there is something to the placebo effect of giving something IV or giving something IM that people will experience some sort of a better analgesic effect from that. But even if you randomize it so that, like, you give somebody a shot of saline and you give them a cup with a placebo, you know, with, with a ibuprofen pill in it, and then you give the other group a placebo pill and an actual shot of ketorolac, it still normalizes where they, they report similar pain scales with both of them. So even if you take that placebo effect into consideration, most of the studies will say that there's no real difference between the two. So it's an interesting discussion. A lot of people might not be able to tolerate PO, so that's where ketorolac comes in handy. If you can give something IM, IV. But we've really, over the last couple of years, because of some of this evidence that's come out, decreased our dose of ketorolac substantially. So like, for example, used to be able to give up to 60 milligrams IM. Now we don't give more than 10 ever. Um, and that's pretty much a standard practice. Now you might work in some groups where they believe that ketorolac gets a better anti-inflammatory response with the higher dose versus not just targeting analgesia, but targeting those inflammatory, just to shut down the inflammatory processes altogether. And that's a different conversation. So when we're talking about acute pain, like urgent care, emergency department pain, low doses are very effective and have been shown clinically to be as effective as higher doses. So these are the maxes I have here, but uh, you can give 10 milligrams IM or IV. That's an easy way to remember the, the, the dose that you should stick to with ketorolac. And you, you just won't get any more benefit with that increased dose. And you're going to increase that GI bleeding risk the higher dose you get. So that is one thing that we can show with different doses of ketorolac. The higher the dose, the higher the side effects, but you don't get any more analgesic benefits. So why would you give more of a dose is the, is the 
the way the literature is trending right now. Again, I'll, I'll put a precaution out there. These are smaller studies and smaller like hospitals doing this. I've yet to see a huge trial come out of like an academic medical center, which probably won't ever happen because no one will make money off studying something like this. But it's uh, just something to consider. The evidence isn't the best right now, but that's what the trend is leading towards. And we've, again, changed our whole ED practice where we change. I don't think I've seen a dose above 10 or 15, sorry. So the, the issue is, I, <laughs> I'm confusing everyone. So the, the trial showed that 10 milligrams of ketorolac was the top. Now ketorolac comes as a 15, a 30, and a 60. So, so the nurses don't have to eyeball a really weird amount of volume, we just give 15. So you give the whole 15 milligram vial and that's it. And sorry to confuse people, not gonna test you on ketorolac dosing, but just so you know, like the 15 milligram IVIM dose, but technically 10 was what was studied as the, the appropriate dose. So what happened was we had some providers going to these conferences. There were these, they were talking about 10 milligrams of Toradol. They're coming back and ordering Toradol 10 milligrams and it was rounding it to a really weird volume in our computer system. So people were getting like 11 milligrams. And the nurses were like, I can't see this. I don't want to draw it up that way. And so finally we were able to convince them, let's just compromise and give 15 and then you can give a whole vial. So anyway, end of discussion there. Um, diclofenac uh, comes topical orally. It's also an ophthalmic preparation, so it's an ophthalmic NSAID for anti-inflammatory effects that way. I'll talk about that more here in a second, especially the topical preparation of diclofenac is pretty interesting. And then indomethacin comes oral and rectal. Uh, it's very common in OB, and we'll talk about it during our peripartum discussions. Um, there's also some applications. It's first line for gout, and that'll be in the rheumatology lecture next week. And that's just because that's where it was studied, or that's they studied gout patients with indomethacin. It's not like other NSAIDs aren't effective, but indomethacin happened to be studied. Uh, so that's what's still used as sort of a first line, even though you could use ibuprofen or naproxen without issue. Um, Diclofenex, one to keep in the back of your mind as an alternative for people who have problems with taking NSAIDs orally. Now, that could be because of side effects or because of contraindications or something like that. Um, and Volterran or Flector patches aren't for everyone, but um, here's just a, a little chart to show you that if you take Diclofenex orally, you get systemic absorption, of course. Um, and if you use the gel, you get 20 or 6%, depending on how much gel you're using a day. And so the gel can be really great for like localized osteoarthritis. I think of it like if you have you know arthritis in your knee or something like that, it works really well for a product that's not going to cause a lot of systemic issues, if any. I mean, 6% absorption probably isn't enough to really cause a lot of side effects. Now, certainly there is a risk of causing some kidney issues, causing some GI bleeds. You can't rule it out completely, but it's certainly a lot safer than taking it orally. So for patients who need NSAIDs or are responding well to NSAIDs, and again, you don't have to cover their whole body in it. If you have somebody with rheumatoid arthritis affecting multiple joints, probably not a great idea. But again, like a one localized joint, uh, it could be a really nice solution for some of those patients. And um, the Voltaren gel is really popular. I don't really see the flector patches used all that much. The patch is going to be less easy to apply locally, and it's going to be going to give you less utility as far as putting it over a joint and having it stay when it articulates and things like that. So I think the gel is just more convenient for the majority of patients. The gel is a newer product, um, but it is generic now, so I think it's come down in cost quite a bit. Anyway, that's a good one to keep it. People always ask me like, oh, I can't do NSAIDs, Tylenol doesn't work, I don't want to try an opioid, you know, what, what should I try? It's like, well, have you tried a topical NSAID preparation? That's one that I don't think people think about a lot of times, and it can be a good solution for some people. Okay, uh, more NSAIDs. Um, these ones are not super common either, so I'm not too concerned about them. The only thing I really want you to know from this slide is that meloxicam is a once daily NSAID. So it's the least frequent administration of all the NSAIDs we've talked about. And uh, so it's a great option if you want somebody to be on a simplified regimen. It's mostly COX-2 selective, so you do have to take that into consideration with CV risk. Uh, but it's also going to be less likely to cause GI bleeding too, so you've got that benefit there. Um, useful for rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis where you want somebody on round-the-clock NSAIDs uh, for chronic types of pain situations. Um, it's, a, it's a nice advantage with the once a day there. So that's really all I want you to know from this slide. The other ones, not to say they aren't used ever, but they're just, they're kind of oddballs and there's nothing really to say that we haven't said already. And then finally, uh, Celecoxib or Celebrex, the only viable pure COX-2 on the market right now. And we talked about limited GI bleeding risk. Um, if you give an NSAID to somebody and somebody's on round-the-clock NSAID therapies, we're always going to give them some sort of stomach acid suppression regimen. That's usually a proton pump inhibitor like Prilosec or Nexium. And even though Celecoxib doesn't affect those 
cyclooxygenase enzymes, we still use a PPI with them just for the sake of doing it. Um, it, it makes us sleep better at night, and I think they have actually shown that there is less GI bleeding risk. Because there's always theoretical toxicity that you could get some crossover and some minor COX-1 inhibition, even though we say it's purely selective, maybe it's not truly selective, like it's like 1 to 100 ratio or something like that. Um, you never really know. So it's just a precaution, but you do still give them with some sort of stomach acid suppressing regimen. Dose twice daily. Doesn't have any effect on platelet function. Uh, its doses are greater than 200 milligrams day associated with increased cardiovascular risk. So that's where we cap the dose. Usually people are on 100 BID. Um, if they're on more than that, I would maybe question why they're on more than that. Because you're in that category where you're high risk for CV events. All right. Talk about muscle relaxants quick and then take a break before we do opioids. Does anybody have any questions on NSAIDs or, IV or a Tylenol, aspirin, pain management? All right. Muscle relaxants are kind of a confusing mixed bag of um, mechanisms, and I don't have a lot to say about them, but they are commonly used, so it's worth talking about them for a little bit. Uh, basically, they, there's a couple different ones out there, but they're generally going to be have sedating and anticholinergic properties. That's going to be a common theme you're going to see with them. And they're going to have some sort of central nervous system suppression mechanism. Now, how that actually works, we don't really understand fully with some of them, but I'll, I'll try and explain it the best I can. Um, essentially, they're going to relax muscles and relieve spasms, use short-term for acute relief, um, but we have some that actually are useful for long-term use as well. And uh, things like patients with post-stroke spasticity or spinal cord injury who are recovering from that, who have some chronic type of spasm, wherever it may be, we can use um, some different strategies for that. But they're different drugs, so I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, muscle relaxants are kind of like their own tier of pain medication. So if you think about, I don't know, if you break things down into three groups, you have non-opioids, non um, like ibuprofen, acetaminophen, you have your muscle relaxants, and then you have your opioids. I kind of think of those as the core group of um, analgesic medications. And um, you can certainly use these in conjunction with them. <clears throat> Just the one thing to be careful is the sedation component of muscle relaxants in combination with opioids. So that'll uh, compound. So a lot of people might take one or the other and not both, or at least alternate them, or maybe just take one at night, or just so that they know their limit on that. But people can get overly sedated if they take both at the same time. All right, uh, cyclobenzaprine or Flexerol is probably the most common acute medication used. I work with a lot of physicians who have said to me over the years that, and, and PAs too, that they don't believe in this medication at all. It's basically placebo. Whether it works or not, I don't know. I've never actually taken it, so I have no opinion on it personally. Um, it is super common though, so some people like prescribing it, and I think it's one of those that also is like it's a step above that ibuprofen. It's a step above that acetaminophen, and it might just work for some patients out there, and certainly worth a shot. It's not abused that I know of, so it's not like even though it's a sedating drug, it's not really like it's it's not a controlled substance for one thing. Um, and as far as I know, people don't abuse Flexerol, but I could be wrong. People abuse lots of weird stuff. Um, anyway, the mechanism is not really well understood. It likely reduces somatic motor activity, influencing alpha and gamma motor neurons. Somewhere in the central nervous system, it has effects on some type of neuro neurotransmitters, theoretically norepinephrine, which causes a, a downstream effect where it decreases muscle spasticity. That's the best I got for you. Um, commonly used, it's generic, it's cheap. Um, usually people don't take this one chronically. This is usually an acute medication. If somebody's been on Flexerol for years, that's a red flag. Um, why are they on that? Um, similar in structure and mechanism to tricyclic antidepressants. We haven't talked about TCAs, uh, but TCA is just one little pearl of wisdom here. Again, not, not for this exam, so I'm not going to test you on this particular pearl, but um, tricyclic antidepressants are one of the most deadly drugs you can take in overdose. There's no cure for them. And if somebody overdoses on them, they cause cardiovascular toxicity, and essentially if you don't get to some place in time, you'll probably die. Um, so if somebody overdoses on a bunch of meds and you do a urine tox screen on them and it flags for TCAs, it makes people really nervous. Uh, but these drugs actually have a really similar structure. So if you take Flexerol, you can flag for a TCA positive. So if somebody overdoses on a bunch of Flexerol, they might be really sleepy. They probably aren't at risk for like a tricyclic presentation but their UTOX might show that. So just so you guys know that, if you go into emergency medicine or toxicology, uh, that's something that might trigger that. It's a common one that we see that causes a lot of people to get scared. Um, they are anticholinergic, so people will dry out with these. Uh, so be careful with our elderly population. We want to avoid using them probably in most older patients, or if you do use them, use them at lower doses. 
and use them as seldomly as possible. Um, again, in an overdose situation, you might see some of that tricyclic antidepressant. You'd have to take a ton of Flexerol to do that, though. Generally speaking, not nearly as toxic as a true TCA, but again, you'll see that show up on the drug screen. Um, some other CNS depressants that are common uh, we use, and again, these mechanisms are all a little bit different, but they get lumped together. So methylcarbamol or robaxin um, is another oral one that's commonly used, kind of like Flexerol. It's, it's an acute pain-related thing, acute spasticity-related thing. Uh, it is actually available IV, too. So sometimes we see this, especially in our spine population. They use this post-op, and it's thought to reduce some of the, well, some of the spasticity associated with post-op spine surgery but also um, it decreases uh, opioid use to post-op spine surgery. So they've seen some synergy with that. And anything that can decrease opioid use is always a, a win in the hospital. Opioid use is heavily associated with increased length of stay, um, decreased mortality, uh, delirium, things like that. So if we can get rid of opioids, that's preferred, and methylcarbamol is the lesser of two evils in this case. So if you work for spine surgery or, or some other types of surgeries might use it post-op too, you might see that as a, a more common option that you see as part of like an order set or something like that, like standard of care. But it can be used in acute areas as well for acute muscle spasms orally. Uh, Carisoprodol or Soma is a little bit different. It's got the highest potential for abuse. It actually is a controlled substance. And here we're getting more towards drugs that are like benzodiazepines. So benzodiazepines like Valium or Diazepam or Ativan or just Lorazepam, um, those actually have some antispastic properties too. Um, and in fact, diazepam is a really common antispasm drug that we give for our spine patients as well. So you're kind of moving more towards mood altering drugs that might cause a little bit of euphoria uh, and be higher likelihood for abuse down here versus like methylcarbamol and cyclobenzaprine don't really have those components. So again, they all kind of do the same thing, but they work in different spots of the brain and have different effects on people, especially their side effect profiles tend to be different. So that's all I want you to know. Don't worry about diazepam or benzos. We'll go through a whole lecture, well not a whole lecture on benzos, but we'll talk about uh, benzos in, in great detail during psych. So just hold off on that, keep that in the back of your pocket, that you can use it as a, a spasticity agent, but that's it. And then very briefly, talking about chronic use, the only time you're going to see chronic use is if you work uh, with patient populations who are undergoing rehab. So we actually have, we have a lot of PAs that work in our rehab institute, our inpatient one, um, so it's definitely a viable career for you guys, but it's something that uh, is, is highly specialized too. So I think that there's um, some, some things to talk about here really quickly. Tizanidine and baclofen, probably the two most common long-term chronic uh, antispastic agents I see. And I'm not going to talk about them too much other than they're, they're frequently dosed, you know, TID versus, and um, baclofen's often dosed, I don't have it on here, but it's often dosed QID. And usually the, the one thing to note about these is they aren't used as needed. Every once in a while you see somebody on as needed tizanidine or baclofen, much more common to see somebody on scheduled baclofen or tizanidine. That's probably because they have some chronic either uh, brain injury or spine injury where they have chronic spasticity. That's why they're taking it. Uh, baclofen's got a cool pump application that somebody invented at some point. This looks really big because this isn't a kid, um, but they're these metal disc things that get implanted sort of here, and then they have a tunnel that goes into the intrathecal space, and then that releases baclofen at a certain rate. Kind of like an insulin pump, but it's completely implanted. There's no exterior. You can access it um, via, like, I don't know if it has a port or just a way you can inject medication into it. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the, the point is, is it's actually under the skin as opposed to being exterior, like on somebody's hip. All right, so that's that. And let's take a quick 10-minute break, and we'll come back and talk about opioids. Okay, opioids, everybody's favorite drugs. Okay. So, all right, there's a lot to talk about, about opioids, so I'm going to try and streamline it as much as I can. But anyway, we, we love opioids in this country. We use tons of them. They're really prevalent for a lot of different uses, anything from mild acute pain to severe chronic pain. Uh, patients will all respond very differently to dose, and but there's you know a similar group of responses, but depending on the medication or, or dose, you might get a significantly different responses in patients, how they feel when they take an opioid. Um, the pharmacokinetics are very different between the different agents, a lot of different dosage forms out there. Uh, side effect are really easy to recognize, and there's a very standard set of them. Um, highly abuse, high abuse potential, which everyone knows. Fatal and overdose, 
uh, generally safe in pregnancy, though. So there's that. Um, this is a this is a poppy plant. And if you didn't know how um, heroin is produced, what what they do is when the poppy bulb is closed, you can kind of cut the side of it with a razor blade, and the stuff comes out. It's like a latexy material. And they scrape it off and then they dry it out. That's opium essentially, and then they can get heroin out of that. It's really expensive to make that. What was that? Yeah. <laughs> I hear that. I missed that comment. What was it? <laughs> All right, anyway, sorry, I like drugs of abuse if you haven't gotten to that part. Not like to do, just I think they're interesting. Right. I, I worked in an inner city ED for, yeah, so anyway, yeah. Um, basic, so some basic, I like tox and stuff like that too. It's kind of up my alley. But so anyway, uh, basic opioid stuff, analgesia, minimum uh, to significant pain relief possible depending on agent and dose. Again, some opioids, like we talked about codeine, don't have a whole lot of effect. And then you have things like fentanyl, which can uh, put somebody under very quickly. Uh, there's no ceiling dose to opioids, so you can get people who are very tolerant of them on really high doses. So examples would be like chemotherapy related pain. Uh, that's a common type of patient you might see, or somebody who's undergone multiple spine surgeries. Sometimes we see patients like that with really, really high uh, pain tolerance. So it would you know, kill any one of us if we took that much on a daily basis, but for them, it barely keeps their pain at bay and they don't really have any adverse effects to it, surprisingly enough or at least no sedation overtly. Um, effective pain relief limited by its toxicity. So you can titrate the drug to pain relief. You can also titrate the drug to the amount of um, sedation or respiratory depression somebody's going to have. Eventually, you give too much opioid, the person's going to die because they're going to stop breathing. So we don't want to do that. We want to try and get their pain under control. So it's a balancing act between how sedated, how much respiratory depression can you give the patient without um, compromising the analgesic effect you want to give. So there's that balancing act of giving opioids. Um, synergistic effects. So uh, combination NSAIDs have been actually studied pretty well. To If you give somebody an NSAID at the same time as an opioid, you can decrease the overall opioid requirements. So they have a synergistic use there. Uh, so definitely works well to give. That's why you see the combination products. And that goes for Tylenol too. I don't think Tylenol's evidence is as good. But if you combine like ibuprofen and oxycodone, um, you're going to get hopefully away with a little bit less oxycodone use over time. Depends on the type of pain though. Um, benzodiazepines also, so like we just talked about the muscle relaxing capabilities of diazepam, that would also work as a pain management strategy. And by giving benzodiazepines with an opioid, you can decrease the total use of both drugs and get the same effect as if you're just going to give one or the other. All right. Um, opioid mechanism of action. The interesting thing about opioids is they don't do anything to the pain you're having. They alter your body's perception of how it's um, receiving the pain signal. So you have uh, receptors in your brain that exist already that are opioid receptors more or less, and they work on your nat body's natural endorphin system. So when you have, like, if you call, if, you, if, if you're one of those people that runs and experiences a runner's high, I am not one of those people, so I have no idea what that's like. Um, <laughs> but I've told that that's an endorphin type response. Um, and anyway, like exercise, release endorphins, and things like that. Anyway, your body has natural reward systems in place for some of this type of stuff. And when mu receptors are triggered, you get reward downstream pathways, so you get increases in dopamine and all types of things like that. But where that comes from, in some cases, is using this particular pathway. And somebody identified that, well, somebody who probably smoked opium at some point way back when um, realized that you get some analgesic and euphoria effects. And somebody realized that, hey, this dulls pain too, and tried to make it into medicine. And now here we are with all these opioid addicts. Now, I'm not trying to be so, uh, so down on it, but th there are some definitely good applications to opioid, but there certainly have been lots of examples of poor use throughout history, and we're still at that point. We really haven't figured out how to use opioids correctly in this country, no matter how you look at it. I mean, I think we know how to use them. It's just a matter of getting people to do it, right? And that comes down to good prescribing practices, essentially. Uh, so anyway, mu1 is our uh, target, analgesia, euphoria, confusion, and dizziness. So of course, analgesia is what we want. The euphoria comes along with it. Now, I should point this out that, again, these affect people differently. If you take an opioid, you aren't immediately going to feel euphoric. In fact, the majority of people in this room, if we took a dose of oxycodone, we probably wouldn't feel much euphoria. We'd probably feel maybe a little bit relaxed. We might not have a lot of, if we're having pain, it might help a patient get to sleep. Uh, might make us feel a little bit dizzy. Maybe we'd feel a little bit of an altered mental status. But a lot of people don't feel like that euphoric effect from opioids. Some of the people that do put them at higher risk for abuse. So that's where um, 
the way that our brains are wired can affect how likely we are to be addicted to a certain substance. And that's kind of a whole other topic in and of itself. Um, the mu 2 receptor, so all opioids work on multiple mu receptors. They aren't really selective for a single mu receptor, so they're going to hit the mu 1 and 2 uh, for the most part. And uh, that's going to cause respiratory depression, bradycardia, um, GI effects such as nausea and constipation. It's going to lead to the physical type of dependence people experience, which is different than psychological addiction, right? So we're breaking those up. People get dependent on, on these uh, medications to do the same thing over and over again, and the mu receptors have to do with that. Um, one thing that will also happen to a certain degree, but some drugs actually are more likely to affect the kappa receptor. Um, your general opioid analgesic isn't going to do much with the kappa receptor. So really, you're looking at mu1 and mu2. Um, analgesia and dysphoria and psychomimetic effects happen with kappa receptors. So there are some drugs that work on the kappa receptors, which we'll talk about specifically, but mostly it's not a pharmacologically useful target. As you can imagine, dysphoria is not helpful for patients, so um, it's got limited role in, in agonizing it specifically. And the delta receptor, no one really knows what to do with that. <laughs> so as far as I know, there's no drugs that target it directly. All right, so your classic opioid toxidrome, if you want to look at it that way, or adverse effect profile is going to be sedation. We already talked about that. Altered consciousness, decreased respiratory rate. That's going to be the big one as far as somebody overdoses on heroin, they die because they stop breathing. That's what kills somebody. Um, low blood pressure or heart rate. Um, usually hemodynamics aren't substantially affected by opioids. You might see a transient drop, but it's not something that we care about a lot. In fact, if we're looking for... Um, a chronic sedative to give somebody will usually pick an opioid if their blood pressure is really low compared to like a different type of drug. And we'll talk about that stuff in a, in a little while, especially when we talk about critical care. But opioids actually don't have a huge effect on blood pressure or heart rate, which is nice. But they might drop it a little bit. Um, constipation. Chronic constipation is a huge issue for people who take opioids regularly. So those chronic pain people on those super high doses, they're going to be constipated. So it's really important to stay on top of people who are taking opioids regularly with a good bowel regimen, and we'll talk about some of those strategies here. And also um, in the next module, we'll talk about GI and constipation and things like that in more detail. Difficulty urination can happen. Um, uh, myotic pupils is a common presentation for an opioid overdose, but people who take them might just have pinpoint pupils as is. But if you see somebody with some of these symptoms and they have pinpoint pupils, it might be a sign of an overdose. Um, itching, rash. Um, some of the drugs, especially the ones that are more close to the natural product. So if you think of opium as the pure product, right, that you're you're harvesting or whatever, um, the more synthetic we get, the less likely it is to cause itching. And opioids naturally, through a, a kind of a roundabout mechanism, cause histamine release. So morphine is, um, so op opium itself is like 12% morphine or something like that. So um, pure morphine causes more histamine release than like a purely synthetic opioid like fentanyl. So morphine is actually kind of a natural product, whereas something like fentanyl, which probably everybody's heard of at one point, we'll talk about in a second here, um, is a purely synthetic opioid, which doesn't cause the itching as much. So um, allergies are something you're going to see a lot of when it comes to opioid prescribing. You'll see that people had itching with a, a different opioid. It's really common. It's not considered an allergy in most cases. It's just a side effect that happens with the drug. doesn't mean the person can't take it. What I'd rush, watch out for is like a severe rash, like hives or more of like an anaphylactic type response. But a mild rash or itching is, is pretty common with opioids. And it's not a sign of an allergic response. Uh, physical dependence, uh, we talked about that a little bit already, and muscul muscular, muscular rigidity, not super common, but possible. <clears throat> All right, opium, um, dried latex from opium poppy. So this is actually still produced naturally. Um, we don't use opium a whole lot for any type of analgesic pur purpose, but it does exist in a, a pharmaceutical grade. It comes as this tincture, which is like this thick brown liquid, and it's used for severe chronic diarrhea. So remember, opioids are constipating. Opium can be given. It works mostly in the GI tract. You get a little bit of absorption of it, and you might get some of the euphoric effects, but you use it in a dose that really keeps it topical within the GI tract, so you don't get a whole lot of systemic side effects from the opioid, and it works relatively well for that. It's sort of a further down the line therapy. You wouldn't start that on somebody, but it is an option. There's also suppositories that contain opium and also a drug called belladonna. Belladonna is essentially like atropine. It's an um, anticholinergic medication. These have been around for a really long time, too. 
but for ureteral spasms, they're used to stop those um, given when given rectally. So uh, interesting medication. If you work in urgent care or emergency, you will see these used occasionally. Believe it or not, it does get used. However, we can't. We haven't been able to get them. I think the company that makes them kind of just stopped out of nowhere. So who knows if they'll be around or not? Not a very commonly used item, but certainly if you if you work in emergency medicine or, or urology, you'll probably see them used. All right, opioid structures. I don't care that you know the structures just like usual. However, I wanted to show you just some of the differences. So <clears throat> morphine and to some extent codeine are kind of considered your natural opioids. Um, they're more available in nature. So if you isolate opium from a poppy plant, you would find structures that look like this. Um, hydrocodone and oxycodone are what we call semi-synthetic, meaning that they're very similar to our um, uh, well, these are, based, I mean, morphine synthetically made in a lab now. It's not like they're isolating it from poppies, but um, the, the compound's the same as the natural one, where these are slightly modified to be more potent versions of morphine, basically, is how you'd look at it. Hydromorphone is a more uh, advanced semi-synthetic, so here you're getting a lot more um, complicated functional groups coming off of it. And then fentanyl uh, has almost a totally different structure altogether, but they all work on the same receptors. They're all opioids, and they all do essentially the same thing, just to varying de degrees of potency with slightly different side effects. All right, morphine. Morphine's an old medication. It's still very popular today. It's often considered the gold standard for opioid pain medication. Uh, one of the earliest isolated plant alkaloids. It's cheap and effective. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of fun things out on the internet about morphine being used as, as medicine in totally inappropriate contexts in today's life, but it's kind of funny to see some of this stuff um, come out like that. Um, it's available orally, uh, so we have multiple different ways to give this orally. We have immediate release tablets, we have liquid, we have concentrated, non-concentrated liquid. Uh, just for an example, like hospice patients will use a little bit of morphine. Like in, in end of life, a lot of times what happens is you get this thing called air hunger where people are just gasping for breath. And you'd think that by giving them an opioid, you wouldn't want to suppress their, their drive to breathe, but it actually calms them down a little bit and allows them to breathe deeper and longer and slower and can decrease that sensation of air hunger. So it's a comfort care measure. And we use really concentrated morphine and just give it under the tongue. It's a common thing. If you have, happen to work for end of life care, you'll see that done a lot. Or oncology would be somewhere you'd see that used especially. Um, but you can give it in liquid form for other ways too, like if you just have somebody who can't tolerate the pills for some reason. Um, it comes as immediate release tablets in multiple different strengths. The half-life of morphine is about like four hours, so immediate release tablets not going to provide a ton of relief, but for a breakthrough pain it, it's an okay choice. Extended release products, you have MS cotton. MS stands for morphine sulfate. It's a Poorly approved um, abbreviation. People don't like it because they're like, oh, you could mix it up for something else. But the brand name is MS Cotton, but it is morphine extended release. And that's the most common one you'll see for the ER. A couple of newer products came out recently, Avenza and Cadian, slightly longer duration. So if somebody's taking a regular MS Cotton regimen for chronic pain, they're usually on it three times a day. So it's not super convenient. Whereas like a Vinza or Cadian, they could take it once or maybe twice a day, a little bit more convenient for the patient. However, MS cotton, very cheap for a long-acting opioid. Avenza and Cadian, not cheap, quite expensive. They're, they're newer medications, but same drug. Um, available IV, so morphine IV is still used a ton today. Um, just depends on, on the, the prior writer's preference. Some like morphine better than Dilaudid. We'll talk about Dilaudid here in a second, uh, but they're, they're, it's an IV available um, opioid. It's common post-surgery, common for pain. Um, it's got a slower onset than some other opioids, so it might not produce quite an uh, intense euphoric effect in some patients, as opposed to some of the more potent ones. It also might not be quite as sedating as some other ones. Um, the other thing about morphine is it does have active metabolites that can accumulate in renal dysfunction. So if you have older patients with poor kidneys, morphine will have an extended duration of effect, and it can accumulate uh, in, in more well, in a more aggressive way than some other ones. Like, for example, fentanyl, our synthetic drug, doesn't have any active metabolites, so it just gets eliminated right away. So it's got a more predictable half-life where the less renal function you have, the more morphine you have sitting around. Uh, hydrocodone and oxycodone, uh, really similar drugs. Oxycodone is slightly more potent, but essentially they're kind of one-to-one -one as far as their dose goes. I think there's a lot of confusion around these two, mostly because... For the longest time, um, hydrocodone was a controlled three narcotic and oxycodone was a C2. There was recently some legislation passed on the federal level that moved hydrocodone into a C2. So now they're the same thing, meaning that they both have a very high potential for abuse. That's the class 
that the DEA gives them. So C1 means no medical benefit, and then two through five, it's just varying degrees of how likely is this drug to be abused by the general population. And these ones get a C2, highly likely to be abused. Um, hydrocodone comes immediate release. Most common presentations, everybody here has probably heard of Vicodin, right? Um, Norco, Vicodin doesn't actually exist anymore. Vicodin was five milligrams of hydrocodone and 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. The FDA banned any combination narcotic combos that had anything more than 325 milligrams of acetaminophen in them. So that meant that the Vicodin brand effectively died and the Norco brand is now what we carry, although they're all generic, so it doesn't matter. But the Norco brand is five milligrams hydrocodone, 325 milligrams of acetaminophen. So you actually can't prescribe Vicodin anymore, even if you try to. It doesn't exist. It's illegal. Um, hydrocodone ER is a product that came out. It's a 24-hour with an abuse deterrent mechanism. What that means is that if you try to grind it up and shoot it or snort it or something, it's hard to grind up. That's what an abuse deterrent is. Now, where there's a will, there's a way. I'm sure people have figured out how to do stuff like this. And don't know, uh, but um, abuse deterrents always make me laugh a little bit because it's like, well, nothing's really truly a complete deterrent. Um, Oxycodone, everyone on the planet has heard of Percocet and Oxycontin, um, super hot buzzwords as far as like the opioid epidemic and everything like that. And they get a really bad rap, but every opioid has some potential for abuse, and they all essentially do the same thing. So um, Oxycodone is uh, available as an immediate release product. Um, one thing that's different about hydrocodone and oxycodone, hydrocodone as immediate release, you can only get in combination with acetaminophen. It doesn't come as just hydrocodone. That product doesn't exist. Oxycodone, you can just have plain oxycodone immediate release, or you can have oxycodone combined with acetaminophen, which is Percocet. And Percocet is five milligrams of oxycodone, 325 milligrams of acetaminophen. Don't care that you know these for the exam, but just for your reference in case you're curious. There are, there are a lot of different variations of these too. So like the basic one is five hydrocodone, five oxycodone, but you might have ones that are seven and a half milligrams, 10 milligrams, and, and that's the that's the hydrocodone or oxycodone component changing and increasing in dose. The acetaminophen component always has to be 325, can never go higher than that. Um, Oxycontin is oxycodone extended release. It's Q12 hour. It's got an abuse deterrent. Um, Oxycontin uh, was on the market for a long time. It went generic, which everyone is happy about because it made it a lot less expensive. However, the tablets were you could crush them just like any tablet. You know, anyone could grind those up. Um, so then the FDA said no, or the DEA, or somebody said no, you got to change this. So then Purdue reformulated them to this deterrent, hard to crush tablet. And now they have a patent on it again, so it's now expensive. Well, this is a while ago, but it's it's been expensive for quite some time. Um, OxyContin isn't cheap uh, compared to like MS Cotton, which is a little bit less expensive, but it does have that abuse deterrent, so it's harder to grind up. Um, let's see, what other things we're talking about? These are semi-synthetics. They cause less itching and are slightly more potent than morphine. We'll talk about dose equivalents here in a second. Inexpensive immediate release tablets. The, the immediate release Percocet, um, the immediate release regular oxycodone are, are dirt cheap. Percocet is not expensive unless you're buying it off the street. Uh, but it's like you can buy a thousand count bottle of it for, for nothing. It's very cheap compared to some other things. So uh, from a cost savings perspective, it's a nice pain management strategy for acute pain if you want a low dose. Five milligrams of oxycodone isn't a ton of opioid. I mean, most people can take that, probably not feel a whole lot different. It might dull some of their pain. It depends on your age maybe, but it's not like you're you're shooting a bunch of morphine, like getting an IV or something like that. It's going to be a lot different. And oral has a big, uh, oral versus IV is going to change your dosing strategy quite a bit depending on the equivalence. And we'll talk about that here in a second. I'll just say this again. I said it already today. Careful with the acetaminophen combo products. If you're going to prescribe Percocet or um, Norco, fine. Uh, the synergy between the acetaminophen and the narcotic might help them use less overall and provide an added pain relief, but just be careful with the extra acetaminophen out there. And again, these are super highly abused, right? These are the, the, the drugs that, um, again, very common, uh, at least sold on the street, very commonly known throughout the general population, um, and a lot of people just have them sitting in their medica 
medicine cabinets at home. They got them after surgery. They got 60. They used two. They're sitting at their house. Not that that's me. <laughs> um, okay. If you do, <laughs> this is actually it. That, that, this is actually a true story. I, I, I'll just say this quickly. I bruised my ribs once. I was on a jet ski. It went way too fast. And I flew off on a wave and I like felt really weird and I like smacked my ribs and I couldn't really breathe that well like without it causing excruciating pain. I went in to see if they were broken. Not that they could do anything about it. And they gave me 60 Norco. I used like two it helped me sleep and then i felt a little bit better the next day and then um i still i, I probably should just throw them away but they're sitting in my house why do i still have them i don't know what if i break my Take ribs again pharmacy. yeah now pharmacies well, are getting a lot well i know uh, <laughs> now we're getting uh now we're getting much more access to narcotic disposal what am i trying to say solutions that are more convenient for patients so previously you had to bring them to like a police station or something but like our alina um, our Atlanta community pharmacies now all have these little boxes in them and you can put whatever you want in there assuming it's not like a contaminated sharps or something like that but you could go take your old Norco and throw it in there and there's no questions asked where it came from they just dispose of it and get it um, taken out of the system in a secure and legal fashion so you're seeing a lot more of that access for people to be able to get rid of old junk like that which I should probably do a reminder to self um, okay Let's talk about Dilaudid. Um, hydromorphone is <clears throat> the generic name. Dilaudid is the brand name. Uh, Dilaudid is another super common brand name that a lot of people know. It's one of the most effective opioids for acute pain management, and this is going to be a mainstay for post-surgical care. Um, Dilaudid is essentially in everybody's order sets. Um, it's a more rapid effect. Uh, it's morphine with a more rapid onset and without the active metabolite. So it's about eight times it's more potent than morphine. Now we dose that appropriately. So for morphine, you're going to give 10 milligrams. You might give one milligram of Dilaudid, right? So we aren't just slamming people with opioids. It's not like you have to be opioid um, experienced to be able to take Dilaudid. You just have to dose it correctly. Um, there's no renal issues, uh, no renal accumulation. Uh, itching goes down a little bit compared to even hydrocodone and oxycodone. And it's IV and PO immediately. So one thing about these semi-synthetics, you might notice if you didn't know IV equivalent. So IV oxycodone, IV hydrocodone do not exist in a pharmaceutical prepared product. Hydromorphone, of course, does. Um, so you have IV and PO immediate release. There's a long acting product out there called Exalgo, which is like a once daily again. These are really weird drugs that people rarely use these. Um, the only, the most common extended release ones I see are the oxycodone, oxycontin, and then the MS cotton. Those are pretty much the ones that insurances will pay for. They're a little bit cheaper. These newer ones that are Q24 hours, just you don't see them quite as much every once in a while, but it's not, not super common. Um, hydromorphone is a much more common inpatient use as far as IV management goes versus a outpatient use. People don't generally take Dilaudid orally regularly. It happens every once in a while, but if they're going to be on a chronic oral pain regimen, they're usually switched to like a, a long-acting oxycodone or a long-acting morphine or a fentanyl patch that provides continuous fentanyl, and I'll talk about that here in a second. But for PCAs, they're a great choice, and a PCA is patient-controlled analgesia. And you have uh, a pump that looks kind of like this, this is what our pumps look like. It's got this big syringe in it, which has the uh, hydromorphone. You can have fentanyl, you can have morphine, PCAs too, so it doesn't have to be Dilaudid, but most often it is. And so what happens is after surgery, a lot of the times, somebody might start a patient on these. And the cool thing about a patient-controlled analgesia is it's the same, it's exactly how it sounds. So the person can bolus dose themselves. They have this little button, and they can give themselves a bolus whenever they want. They have a lockout interval on it, so if they try and overuse it, it doesn't let them give them any more. Um, it has a max dose per 24 hours. So if they hit their max dose, it just shuts it off altogether. Usually the PCA has a continuous infusion on top of it, so it's going at a really low rate intravenously and then they can bump themselves on top of that so that's how PCAs are done it's actually a really effective strategy for not only staying on top of a patient's pain but also reducing opioid use overall as opposed to like scheduling Dilaudid Q4 hours or something like that where the patient might be getting more than they need or might be missing doses you give a low continuous infusion and then you bolus on top of it now funny enough we're like at a critical shortage the company that makes these um, special syringes to go in these pumps, like can't make enough of them. I don't know. You get these really weird things when you work in a hospital. So we're actually really low on PCA. So what we've done over the last month is we told all of our surgical groups that if they want to order a PCA post-op, they have to get a pain consult first. That has actually decreased our PCA use from like five a day to less than one a day. And people are still getting, we still have PCAs. We don't, we're not out of them completely yet, uh, but we've decreased our use substantially just by doing that. So again, 
some of those strategies that come about for like a drug shortage like this, we find out, hey, maybe we don't need to use PCAs in all these patients and we can limit our opioid use to maybe just a few boluses here or there. So get some stuff like that. So people working with those surgeons, keep an eye on them. It's you guys, right? Okay, fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is a pure synthetic opioid, as I've said, super potent. Um, when we're talking about potency, we're talking about fentanyl dose. Common fentanyl dose for somebody is like 25, 50, 100 micrograms, whereas morphine, 10 milligrams, dilated, 1 milligram. So you're talking about multiple factors of tens uh, in reduced doses compared. So really potent opioid. And again, you can use this in an opioid naive patient uh, acutely. And in fact, we use um, fentanyl in a lot of different applications. There's some really cool ways to give fentanyl. Um, there is no FDA approved oral dosage form. You know, you hear about, you guys heard about Prince overdosing on fentanyl, right? That was in the news. Um, there's no way you can get, you can't go to like a pharmacy and, and prescribe for fentanyl oral. It doesn't exist. So how fentanyl got into Prince's drugs, I'm not entirely sure. There must be some sort of a supply chain where people are getting a hold of the raw material and, and cutting their product with it or selling it as is. I'm not entirely sure. That's where you get these really big waves of opioid overdoses because people buy heroin, it's cut with fentanyl, and fentanyl is way more potent than heroin. And then you have like 20 people in the same city overdose at once, and it's because it was a tainted supply. So we see that happening a lot. And again, how they're getting that fentanyl, I'm not entirely sure, but it's happening. But anyway, there's no approved oral dosage form. Fentanyl is not great, doesn't have great bioavailability. It absorbs about 30% of the dose you swallow will absorb. So um, other routes are much more preferred with fentanyl. Very commonly used IV. <clears throat> um, it's a very heavy sedative too. It, it's very fast onset. And so a lot of times people will get this during surgery, post-surgery, they might get it a little bit of fentanyl during surgery. Nice thing is it's sedating and it provides analgesia. So you get that pain relief component in addition to the sedation. Um, transdermal effects. We'll talk about fentanyl patches here in a second. It also comes as this funny thing called a, a fentanyl, I call them a lollipop, it's not really what they're called. It's Actique, it's a, it's a buccal absorbing technique, and this is photoshopped, I think. I found this on Google and I thought it was funny. You'd never <laughs> use this in a kit, I, I hope not anyway. But anyway, it's like 300 micrograms of fentanyl in the tip, and this is what the product does actually look like, though. It's a little sucker type thing. And you cheek it uh, for a little bit, it absorbs buccally, and then you take it out. It's kind of like a PCA almost that would use buccally, so you can kind of control how much you give. It's mostly for highly, well, it's, it's only for highly open opioid tolerant patients and it would oftentimes be used maybe for like end-of-life care or things like that. I don't see it used very often. We do keep them in the hospital if every once in a while you have a patient on it, but it's rare. It's kind of an odd medication, but it's a it's a Minnesota U of M uh, produced or not produced, but invented dosage form, believe it or not. Uh, so there's no itching with fentanyl. Yeah. I'm just curious what it tastes like. I have no idea. We don't have like a flavor? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Cherry. <laughs> Probably bad. <laughs> The thing is, you shouldn't really be like, well, I mean, you probably taste it a little bit, but you shouldn't really be tasting it, because you if you're using it correctly, you should be cheeking it, and it should be absorbing quickly in small amounts. Um, if you're sucking on it, you're doing it wrong. So I don't know. I'm, they probably, <laughs> so they probably <laughs> that sounds really bad. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> they, they don't use, uh, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Um, they don't use, um, they don't use them for like, uh, what am I trying to say? With I mean, if you're using it buccally, you're probably administering it for a certain amount of time specifically. So the formulation behind it, they probably aren't thinking about taste. So I'm, I'm guessing it doesn't taste great, but it probably does have like a sugary substance to it that they made it from. But I've never had, fortunately, I should say, I've never tried one. So <laughs> uh, again, fentanyl is super sedating. And uh, the one thing to know is, again, you can use the IV in small doses for opioid naive patients. It's a great urgent care option, especially for somebody with renal failure or a bunch of opioid itching issues or they've tried other things and haven't worked. You can give fentanyl. I don't have it on here, but I would key this in um, nasally too. Um, what we do is we take the IV form, we draw it up in a syringe, just like you would give it injectable. And you can screw on this little um, nasal atomizer thing. It's like a foam wedge that goes into the nostril and you just squirt it in. It absorbs almost one to one with IV. It has almost as fast of an onset as IV. So like for kids or pediatric use and acute pain, it's great because you don't have to get IV access and it works just as well. So we see a lot of that being used and it's a really good option. Uh, for people. And you can't do that with Dilaudid. You just have too much volume. Fentanyl is concentrated enough and it's potent enough where you can use it with the really low volumes. Because each nostril can only take probably about 0.5 mils before you, it just starts to drip out and doesn't absorb. So that's really your limit. And fentanyl, you can actually get pretty good analgesic response with that low of a volume. So kind of a cool thing about fentanyl there. <clears throat> 
Um, never put a fentanyl patch on somebody who's opioid naive and never use the lollipop on somebody opioid naive. This came up with one of our providers. Some person came into our ER when I was working a while ago and they were like, uh, yeah, this person said they're supposed to start on a fentanyl patch. Can we get them going? I'm like, well, what do they take right now? Nothing. Oh, that's a red flag. You don't just start on a fentanyl patch without taking anything. You have to take something. In fact, the whole dosing scheme of fentanyl patches is based on what opioids you're on currently. If you aren't on any, you don't get fentanyl patches. That's the rule. So if that ever happens, that's a red flag. Sorry, my, my computer just freeze. Oh, there we go. Good. All right. A little. I like. I like talking about transdermal stuff. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, fentanyl patches uh, are really good options for people in chronic pain. Um, they provide 72 hours of drug, and uh, it, you can put multiple on. So you could like. You know, if you needed, they come in different doses, of course. So, like, it's per hour, micrograms per hour. So, like, let's say you wanted somebody on 75 micrograms, and that wasn't quite doing it, but you didn't want to go up to the next step of patch, which was a 100 micrograms per hour. You could give them uh, 75, and you could also put a 12.5 on, and you could make the difference up that way. So, you could be on multiple fentanyl patches at once. These are the application sites for the fentanyl patches. It comes with, um, it looks like this. It's a really small, clear patch. And when it goes on, you put this kind of thing over it, which looks like this, this skin color thing. Um, it's got a reservoir in it, so it um, absorbs slowly into the transdermal tissues. And then it sort of creates a depot effect that leaches out slowly after that. So it's all about concentration gradients with how it moves out. Fentanyl patches are super dangerous if somebody gets a hold of them and chews them or does something weird with them. Um, you can uh, imagine like a pet or a kid. I don't think kid, I don't know if kids would really take a patch and just chew it, but you never know. Um, certainly possible. Think about fentanyl absorbing buccally, chewing a patch that has 75 micrograms per hour for 72 hours worth. There's a ton of fentanyl on a fentanyl patch. You can easily kill somebody um, if they're if they chew it or, or cheek it or something like that. Um, so uh, definitely a problem there with the abuse. But um, so there's some different special things you should do to get rid of them. But anyway. There's uh, just some things to consider with fentanyl patches, but again, uh, only for chronic pain. All right, comparing opioid onset, just so we have a little visual to look at here. Uh, you have things like hydromorphone kind of coming up gradually. Where's our morphine? Morphine's got a slowest onset of this graph. Um, here's regular fentanyl in the, this fuchsia color. And then some of these drugs that I haven't talked about yet, but I'll talk about in a second, sufentanyl, alfentanyl, and remy, um, really fast onset. They provide basically instant super deep sedation. So the only time we see these used um, are surgeons that do like advanced spine surgery, like to use them when there's specific neural monitoring involved for the cases and they really need a deep continuous sedation, they'll do remy fentanyl. Um, it's really expensive, but it tends to work a lot better than just regular fentanyl. You aren't going to see that used for acute pain, though. So that's really only a post-surgical thing, more of an anesthesia-related thing. So I'm not going to talk about them a whole lot, other than just knowing that they're they're really potent, like 10 times more potent than fentanyl, and then they get more potent with that. All right, meperidine. Um, meperidine is Demerol. Demerol has no role in acute pain management. Uh, or pain management in general. It's something that uh, was used for pain for a while. Every once in a while we get a request from a, a provider to use Demerol and it just don't use it. There's no point. Um, it's kind of an opioid, but it has some other issues with it too. It has this toxic metabolite called normoperidine that causes CNS toxicity. The only time we use it is for rigors and it's really low doses. So for kind of uncontrolled shivering, they'll give a little bit of meperidine and that works pretty well, but that's it. That's the only thing we do it for. It's cardiotoxic, it's CNS toxic. There's just uh, there's no use for it with the current opioids we have access to. All right, methadone. Methadone is the longest half-life of a non-extended release opioid. It's got 24 hours. It's analgesic duration at is short at first, but the longer you take methadone, the more it lasts. So you might see somebody on methadone like every eight hours, and then they might be able to decrease after that. Um, it's historically not thought of as a great option for acute pain management, but there's actually a lot of theories out there that methadone is pretty cheap, so we should maybe be using more of it, and it lasts longer, so maybe you get more bang for your buck when you use methadone. I haven't really seen that catch on, but I've read a few articles advocating for more methadone use. Methadone has some other interesting properties to it, so pretty much what we've talked about so far, really just pure opioids, they really just react with the, or interact with the mu receptors. This one has some NMDA antagonistic properties. What that causes is sort of a dissociative effect between the way that the body, the way that your brain communicates with the peripheral nervous system. And uh, some people can get almost hallucinogenic-like properties with NMDA, but usually not with methadone. 
So it might have a little bit of a different mechanism there. It also has serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibition, which is a common mechanism of several antidepressant classes. And also those medications that cause serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake work for neuropathic pain. Uh, just keep that in the back of your mind for now. I'm not going to test you on that when it comes to methadone. Um, but it is, it is a little bit of an interesting mixed mechanism for methadone. So it's a, a little bit more advanced than a, a simple mu opioid. So it's not a pure opioid in that sense. Again, it's cheap, it's effective, it's probably underutilized, uh, but anyway, I'll say it. that's all I'll say about methadone. Um, methadone, I think a lot of people just have this huge stigma in their mind about methadone because of methadone clinics, and there are a lot of prescribing restrictions. If you prescribe methadone for pain and you have a DEA number, you can do that. There's no restrictions on that, so just remember that. I, I remember I talked to an ED doc who had been working in the ED longer than I'd been alive, and she's like, I can't prescribe methadone because she wanted to, but she was complaining how she couldn't prescribe him, like, it's for pain, right? Yeah. You can prescribe methadone. Um, you can't prescribe methadone for opioid dependence unless you have a specific DEA and have undergone specific training to do that, with the exception of being in facilities that allow that for emergency purposes sometimes. Um, so that's the big prescribing difference. If you're prescribing like for a methadone clinic use, uh, where people come in every day and take their dose, kind of like this gentleman here who's being witnessed by the nurse, that's really common for a methadone clinic. They come in, they get their dose, they have to do it in front of the person. Um, Compliant patients who've been doing it a while might be able to take take-homes, um, but for the most part, they're doing it in the clinic. Methadone prolongs QTC interval, so it can be cardiotoxic and overdose. Uh, one of the worst codes I've ever had that I can remember was somebody who was suicidal and obtained a large bottle of methadone concentrate liquid and basically chugged the thing. And um, Opioids are really easy to reverse and overdose. If you can catch them on time, you just give some naloxone, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, when their QTC is prolonged and they're, they're in an arrhythmia, that won't do anything for that. So methadone is super dangerous in overdose, um, which maybe is a good reason not to let it out into the community in excessive amounts. Um, it is okay in pregnancy to give, so you might have opioid dependence issues in pregnancy, and you could use methadone for those, in case anyone's curious. All right, dose conversions. This is essentially the dose conversions. I, everything's based sort of off 10 milligrams of IV morphine, which is why, you know, they're like, why is this 1.5 of Dilaudid? Well, that's 10 milligrams of morphine. It's kind of like your cornerstone. And a little, it's somewhat of a range. So, like on an exam, I would give you a specific number, and I'll give you your conversion in the question. So I'll tell you, you know, I want to convert somebody, somebody's on IV hydromorphone, and they're getting this much a day, and they want to go home on IV oxycodone. How much should you give them? This is your conversion. Do the math. That's the type of a question I'll give you. Um, if I give you a fentanyl patch, you'll have to convert it all to 24 hours of oral morphine. So how much oral morphine equivalents are they getting a day? So they might be getting hydromorphone in-house. So what you have to do is convert that to the morphine PO equivalent and then match it to this chart, and then that's what type of patch they'll start on. So that's how uh, fentanyl is dosed. Fentanyl patches are dosed. And I'll do, again, practice problems on this. Um, Tepentadol or Nucinta is something that's not super commonly used, but it is an immediate and extended release mu agonist. It also has some inhib inhibition of norepinephrine reuptake, kind of like methadone. Marketed as being more tolerable than standard opioids and having less GI side effects, especially constipation. Uh, I put the ad on here because I think it's silly, but I don't know why they picked a line with the rose. It's just kind of weird. Uh, it's new. It's brand name. It's kind of expensive. I don't see it used a ton, but it's there in case you're curious. Buprenorphine is a mu partial agonist. It doesn't elicit full opiate effects. It has a competitive antagonism properties. It also has some weak, weak kappa antagonism. Um, it can be used PO or IV for the treatment of mild to moderate pain and more commonly taken sublingually for opioid dependence. So this is your methadone alternative for um, people who have chronic opioid dependence. They combine it with something called naloxone. It's called suboxone. So it's buprenorphine plus naloxone. And the reason they do that is so if you were going to try and dissolve the product and inject it, you would be injecting naloxone, which is we'll talk about here in a second, which is an opioid antagonist and basically do no good or would antagonize any opioids you have in your system. Um, suboxone is interesting because it doesn't have quite the same stigmas and restrictions. You can get suboxone from a normal pharmacy. You don't have to go to a methadone clinic for it. Um, so some patients are, we're finding like more from a social perspective that suboxone is more effective for opioid management overall. But it doesn't work for everybody. Sometimes methadone just works better for people. And then the thing about buprenorphine and um, methadone that I didn't really say is that they, they have new effects, but when you take them, they just, they don't have that high euphoric peak that people get. 
Um, methadone, part of that's due to its kinetics. It's got a slower onset. Um, part of it's due to just the pharmacology. And with this being a partial agonist, it's never going to have that full effect um, you're going to get with a uh, with like a standard opioid like morphine or something like that. Opioid, uh, can't talk anymore. Opioid induced hyperalgesia, uh, increased pain sensitivity following exposure to opioids. This is really rare. It comes with people taking tons of opioids. It's actually really well documented in animals. Essentially, if this happens, we treat with an NMDA antagonist called ketamine. Ketamine is an IV anesthetic agent, but ketamine is getting used all over the place. And specifically, it's got some interesting roles in pain. I'm not going to talk about it with respect to pain because it's a little confusing, um, but it could be used as an alternative. I've used ketamine a few times when you have somebody coming in like um, some examples would be like somebody with chronic on uh, some oncology indication that's causing a lot of pain. You're pushing a ton of fentanyl on them. It's not doing anything. You give some ketamine. It tends to work pretty well. Um, but anyway, just something to know that sometimes you give a lot of opioids and you get kind of this like weird paradoxical effect where they get this extreme pain syndrome. And NMDA antagonists can help with that. All right, antagonizing, naloxone. Naloxone is a pure opioid antagonist. It reverses it. If you gave naloxone to any of us, assuming none of us have taken opioids recently, you would get no effect whatsoever. So naloxone is completely harmless, well, for the most part. I mean, you're injecting somebody with something. So there's always a slight risk of that. But um, essentially, it won't do anything to somebody unless they have opioids on board. It's relatively short lasting. It comes in a ton of different delivery forms. So you can give it nasally, you can give it IM, you can give it IV, you can give it via nebulizer actually. So uh, you just can't give it orally. So when you have opioid kits, a lot of times those people are doing an IM or um, some of the kits are designed to do it as a nasal spray too. Nasal spray in the field being probably the easiest to administer if you're looking at like giving a family member's kits or things like that. Um, sometimes if you give somebody an opioid or a, a Narcan and they have a lot of opioids on board, you can kill their high and they'll be really mad at you. They can get agitated and violent with you. It's always important to maybe dose gradually, unless the person's like literally dying on you, work your way up in, in Narcan dose. Um, useful uh, post-operatively and procedurally, again, really small doses are needed just to bring somebody back out of a medically induced coma. Uh, procedurally. First line in life-threatening overdoses, continuous infusion. So like if you have somebody who took a really long-acting opiate, let's say they took a ton of oxycodone extended release, Narcan lasts 30 to 120 minutes. That's not going to cut it. You can give an infusion at a low rate to keep that going and keep those receptors antagonized um, continuously until that wears off. And the kits. So kits have gotten really popular lately. Police can dispense them. Um, pharmacists, I think now there's a law that says we can give them out too. So pretty much everyone can kind of hand out kits as they see a fit. And uh, there's a lot of charities locally that that have the finances to put these things together. So um, yeah, a lot of times our, our year docs will send people home with them or we'll recommend sending people home with them. So it's a really common thing. And all the kit we send them home with is literally just two syringes and, and two vials of naloxone. That's all it is. So. It's nothing fancy. There are more expensive ones that are like pre-filled syringes. Those are way more expensive than just buying the individual components and packaging them together. So more convenient, but a lot more money. All right, naltrexone. Uh, naltrexone is a pure antagonist. It's long acting. It's mostly used uh, for uh, opioid dependence. It's not an acute medication. So the big difference between naltrexone and naloxone, naloxone is acute use, naltrexone is more a chronic use. So you can give these as a long acting IM injection. And what will happen is if somebody tries to inject an opioid or use an opioid, it'll just bounce off the receptor because it's permanently antagonized by this drug that's long acting. Or they'll get a much more blunted response to the opioid they're trying to abuse. So it's an abuse deterrent. It doesn't stop somebody from trying to abuse the drug, but if they try and do it, it, it does uh, antagonize those receptors. So they also use it in alcohol dependence too, believe it or not. We'll talk about that in a second. How alcohol works like an opioid is not well understood. It's not quite there, but anyway, that's all I'll say about that. Um, ma major danger would be precipitating withdrawal. So if you gave it to somebody who's been on chronic opioids for a long time, they could go into withdrawal really quickly, and then you've got a long-acting drug on board that doesn't have much of an effect, or is going to have a substantial effect, and then they're going to end up in severe withdrawal and uncomfortable. Um, you can give it orally as well, and that would be more for uh, chronic constipation. So you can give naltrexone orally, and it'll work in the GI tract. Some other quick specific antagonists, nalbufene is a mu partial agonist kappa agonist. The only time I really see this used commonly is an OB, and they use it for opioid-induced itching at really low doses. It's not really used for pain management. That's all I'll say about that. 
Uh, methylnaltrexone is Relistor, which is a newer drug. It's kind of a cool medication. It's the only drug on the market that really works like this. It's a sub-Q dose every other day, and it's specifically designed for people on chronic opioids for constipation. So basically, you, you take it every other day until you have a bowel movement, and it's been proven to be pretty effective, and again, it's kind of the only one. You could give oral naltrexone like we just talked about, but methyl naltrexone is much more effective for this. So it's actually not terribly expensive considering the relief it provides patients, about 70 bucks a dose, but we'll see if that price stays down like that. All right, codeine, I didn't talk about codeine directly. Um, codeine, I consider more of a cough suppressant than an analgesic medication. Um, opioids do suppress cough, so uh, metabolize to morphine, one-tenth of the potency, most commonly used in combination with clofenacin. So you have Robitussin AC, OTC in some states, uh, C5 in Minnesota, uh, also combined with acetaminophen in a Tylenol form with uh, the brand name T3 is what you'll commonly hear. Um, people who drink like a whole bottle, apparently it's called robo-tripping if you drink a ton of dextromethorphan. I don't know. I've never actually heard that, but somebody told me that once. I thought it was funny. Uh, <laughs> dextromethorphan is not really an opioid, but its structure is actually very opioid-like. It's your common cough syrup. That's what's in Robitussin or Delsim a controlled release. You can't really get an opioid-like effect, but if people drink a ton of it, they do kind of get like a weird euphoric hallucinogenic property from it, so you can abuse it in large amounts, especially Delsim. It's a lot of drug and a small amount of volume, and so if you chug a bunch of Delsim, you will get some odd effects. Uh, Antidiarrheal, Lamotol, and Loperamide are both opioid analogs that work to prevent diarrhea. So these, the nice thing about these drugs is they really don't absorb into the systemic vasculature. They work locally in the GI tract to free up, uh, to prevent opioids intera interacting with the receptors down there, and therefore they prevent constipation, or hopefully they can help uh, with, or sorry, prevent. Um, Prevent the diarrhea from it. Okay, I've been talking far too long. I totally budged that. So um, ignore what I just said. What these are doing is they're causing constipation, not preventing constipation. Sorry, I was on my old train of thought with those other drugs. So these are going to slow down the GI tract for diarrhea. So they're mimicking the opioid's ability to cause constipation, and that's the purpose of it. So sorry, I totally said the wrong thing there. Um, Imodium, commonly used over the counter. Lamotol's uh, prescription only. It is a controlled substance. Uh, it's thought that if you consumed a bunch of it, you might get euphoric on it, but it's it's a really weak control level. It's actually combined with atropine as a subtherapeutic dose to discourage people from injecting it because somebody on the street would know that atropine would make them feel uncomfortable and not inject it. It makes no sense to me, but that's the way it is. All right, uh, let's talk about chronic pain in the last few minutes. Sorry, this is a long lecture. I know I'm getting through it as I can. Um, what you have here with chronic pain is it's really common with cancer patients. Other patients might have this too. Um, the, the idea here is you want to assess daily medication use, and if using a lot of a short-acting medication, you probably want to look at doing something long-term and long-acting. So the idea here is you take all their daily dose, convert it into some sort of an equivalent, and then convert it over to what you want to give them. So the easy way to do it is convert everything to morphine and then go from there depending on what you want to do. You want to select a long-acting agent. Your options are fentanyl, patches, uh, that's specifically the patches, no other fentanyl product, uh, morphine, extended release, so that MS cotton, and oxycontin would be your three options that are most commonly used. Uh, patients should also have something through, for breakthrough pain. So it's really important if you have somebody on a chronic pain regimen that they have something they can take as needed for those breakthrough pain moments too. And that's really how you can assess how much they're using, uh, what the, if their regimen's effective for them. So if they're on a fentanyl patch and they've never you know, for three days and they've only used one dose of breakthrough pain, you could probably go down on that fentanyl patch dose a little bit. If they're on um, the same thing and they're using it every four hours on the, around the clock, that's a sign they should probably go up in it. So that's a way to assess how effective your chronic regimen is. You do get cross tolerance when switching opioids. So if you switch somebody from Dilaudid inpatient, for example, and want them on oxycodone outpatient, you would decrease the dose by about 25 to 50% after you do your equivalent. So you'd figure out how much oxycodone that total daily dilated dose is equivalent to, decrease it by 25 to 50%, and that's about where you'd get your chronic um, amount of oxycodone. And again, I'll have practice problems on this stuff. Withdrawal usually occurs after three days of daily, three weeks of daily use, excuse me, depends on the drug, dose, length of use. Uh, obvious things there. Three to four hours after the last dose, most people will experience craving, anxiety, fear of withdrawal. Uh, eight to 14 hours, restlessness, insomnia. Yawning is a really common thing people do. Um, and then you start to get some of these 
uh, like slud almost effects where they're almost looking like a cholinergic toxicity, rhinorrhea, lacrimation, diaphoresis, and then GI related symptoms. It's one to three days, tremor, muscle spasms, vomiting, diarrhea, tachycardia, and chills. It's really uncomfortable. Um, it's anxiety inducing. It's rarely fatal. The only time somebody would probably be at risk of a fatality from this is if they were really malnourished to begin with or kind of in a frail status. Um, but uh, someone who is generally healthy um, otherwise is not going to die from uh, opioid withdrawal. They're going to be really uncomfortable and feel awful, but they will not die. Um, almost any opioid could be used for treatment. Methadone is a good one because it's long acting and it doesn't produce euphoria. So that might be a good dose to give somebody in buprenorphine, just like we would treat chronic addiction. Um, antagonists, clonidine, benzodiazepines, antiemetics may also be used kind of depending on what. Um, there's some evidence that clonidine works. Um, benzodiazepines might help with some of the side effects too. Antiemetics, of course, to treat the symptoms. Uh, side effects, so the itching is a big one that comes up a lot of times when people get prescribed something um, they'll prescribe a, uh, an antihistamine alongside with it. Hydroxyzine is the most common one I see used, a little bit less sedating than diphenhydramine. Theoretically, either one would work, but uh, most people get visceral or hydroxyzine. Um, and then you got the partial agonist, which could be used IV if you needed to do it. Um, constipation, bowel regimen required. Uh, we'll talk about these medications specifically, so don't worry about the bowel regimen for this exam with the respect of the opioid-related bowel-affecting medications that I talked about already, so don't really worry about Senna or Docusate or PEG.